Hey, it's Mike here, and today red meat is all caps, not bad for you, and the science lied to us, according to Jimmy Dore, backed up by a Dr. Drew Pinsky. Jimmy has 1.3 million subscribers on YouTube, and the video was approaching 50,000 views pretty quickly, but then all of a sudden was gone from YouTube, or at least privated. I have no idea why, we can speculate later. But thankfully, it seems to still be up on every other platform, which is great, because I made an entire response, and then all of a sudden it was gone before I capture the footage, but I was able to get it. And not only did multiple of you email me to respond to this, but I think this is interesting because he cites a study and so we can respond directly to that as well as a big think article that essentially just reads word for word. And the idea that unprocessed red meat is completely harmless was absolutely distorted here. We can see directly from the authors of the study, spoiler alert, quote, in the case of red meat, someone who wants to assume no level of risk shouldn't eat it. And Jimmy more or less spouts this notion that you've been lied to about about meat because of, uh, you know, big money interests, I guess. Every day it seems, Dr. Drew, that I'm coming across another lie that I've been living my whole life because I was told this lie by s science. We're gonna see how that doesn't really line up with the size and power of the meat industry. And then also in terms of this Dr. Dr. Drew, he is definitely an on and off again carnivore who really does support eating meat. He even requests having Sean Baker on as a future guest for Jimmy. But look up Sean Baker also. Uh, I don't know if you guys would know him, but. He's an orthopedic surgeon that eats only meat. And really quickly, I just wanna mention that I have an ebook coming out. It's called Level 5 Vegan, and it is a guide for long-term vegans, which was specifically requested by people. You know, it's not a novel or anything, but it has some sections on social issues, you know, lessons from long-term and ex-vegans, nutrition stuff and more. So keep an eye out for that in the next week or so. Now let's get into who is Jimmy Dore. He's a comedian and political commentator. Now, and I understand why people watch him. He has this sort of relatable curmudgeon next door vibe, but I just wouldn't be getting health science advice from the curmudgeon next door. And it was sponsored by Boeing. And I'm like, wait a <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm watching this show. I'm not in the market for a jet. But the point is Jimmy Dore isn't a scientist and after rambling about how eggs are a superfood, here he is. There's a new study out from the University of Washington. It says red meat is not a health risk. New study slams years of shoddy research. The study is new-ish, it's from 2022, which is good because we've had time for experts to respond to the study, which we will get into. From now on, we'll just call it the burden of proof study. And the main premise is that you know, there are all of these studies linking red meat, we're even talking about unprocessed red meat here, to various diseases, but they say, oh, we're gonna go ahead and put an easy to understand rating system so people can make decisions about it. And with that ranking system they have, they're saying that these red meat health connections are weak which is an interesting word here, but we'll get into that. They found weak evidence of association between unprocessed red meat consumption and colorectal cancer, breast cancer, type 2 diabetes, and ischemic heart disease. He continues reading directly from that highly editorialized Big Think article, which is really just the opinion of the single author. They did a thing where they put a one through five star rating. And any researcher can evaluate published data for a certain health risk. Then using the function, compute a single number that translates to a one through five star rating system. Yeah, they rated disease connection with star one star may have no connection. Two stars, they say, has a risk of outcome of between like zero and 15. Three stars is 15 to 50. Although the article got those exact numbers wrong. And then a five star relationship would be like lung cancer and smoking, they say. But I have to mention, this isn't actually looking at the relative risk. That percentage that they chose was actually their own equation. Or they're feeding various metrics and manipulating the numbers and then getting their own risk outcome percentage. You know, they signed the average log relative risk of the burden of proof risk function over the 15th to 85th percentiles of observed exposure. Notice they cut out anyone below the 15th percentile of meat consumption, deleting vegetarians and vegans. Shoddy research. And the result of their statistical squeezing is that none of the red meat disease connections surpass a two-star rating. However, I do wanna say a weak and two-star and things like that are relative terms. This is a bit less like a scale of one to five and a bit more like 
stars you get from the cops in Grand Theft Auto. Like, you don't want to have any, and the researchers even say that. They told Scientific American in a letter, quote, a person who wants to minimize health risks should still take those low star ratings seriously. Or well, maybe they should have taken their rating system more seriously. Anyway, for an example, they found a weak evidence of harmful association between unprocessed red meat consumption and the risk of colorectal cancer with 50 grams versus none equaling plus 30% risk and then 100 grams at plus 37%. So what does weak mean in this case? Well, in a land, the US, where people are eating 70 plus grams of red meat, unprocessed red meat on average, in terms of colorectal cancer, we're talking about 30,000 cases a year likely being attributable to that red meat consumption. Weak. Well, what is Dr. Drew's response? Well, it's a very advanced scientific argument supporting how red meat is healthy. And what, do you have anything to say about this? That I'm not surprised. I Look, if it gets confusing to you, whatever your grandmother told you, probably about right. And the third dude they have there responds, and honestly, the stuff he says is just wild and unhinged usually, but I agree with him here. Yeah, it's probably the zone. <laughs> whatever has been the advice for the last 300 years, Probably okay. Not to trust then, the Asians? I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, that was the ultimate appeal to history, which we know is flawed in a million ways, but he goes on and starts rambling about seed oil. <laughs> but look, this does not surprise me at all. The, you know, the polyunsaturated fat story is a catastrophe. It turns out, you know, we have all the different fast food com companies in the world switch from tallow to vegetable oil. The one thing we know for sure about vegetable oil when you heat it up is it's carcinogenic. And tallow is probably much, much better for you. Just funny that he's so sure that like heated seed oils cause cancer without presenting any evidence there or science. And then he's like, oh, well, red meat, which is a class 2A carcinogen, according to the WHO, oh, that's all bullocks. And to continue with food fears, Jimmy actually chimed in earlier and was like, well, I'm actually afraid of sugar and I'm just afraid of carbs, period, but not red meat. I'm not afraid yeah, of fat. I'm afraid yeah. of trans fats and I'm afraid mm -hmm. of sugar and I'm afraid of carbohydrates. I'm not afraid of fat. I'm not afraid of red meat. And I've included all this because it seems to be really interesting that they so easily and openly accept that there's a weak association for red meat. Well, all of the studies and research on these things that they're afraid of would also have a weak or possibly no score for connecting them to diseases. Even sugar's association with diabetes would likely be considered a weak connection after they spaghetti algorithmed whatever they did in the burden of proof study. And it's looking even worse for Dr. Drew's claims about vegetable oils because from this study, higher vegetable oil consumption was associated with lower risk of breast cancer. He also alluded to the polyunsaturated fat story, which, you know, means you think saturated fat isn't bad for your heart. He's talking about heart disease here. But again, the data on seed oils here does not support a strong connection. From this study, the devil itself, canola oil was associated with lower mortality, while animal fat in the form of butter was associated with higher total and higher cardiometabolic mortality. I've been eating uh, two eggs every morning with two tablespoons of butter per egg whipped up in a scramble, and I had my heart checked, 0% blockage. Just so you know, 0%. Well, Jimmy's artery anecdote is nice. My guess is that he started his habit in recent years and yeah, the four tablespoons of butter that he puts on his eggs at plus 8% per tablespoon would increase his death risk by 32% for breakfast alone plus whatever other butter he is eating. Most ironically, unlike vegetable oils, quote, butter consumption was positively associated with cancer mortality. So it's not actually about the quality of evidence for these guys, it's about the quality of feeling that they have. And we can even move out of the realm of controversial foods here and say that based off of these rating systems, things like lead paint exposure as a child is probably not strongly actually connected to mental functioning or mental state as an adult. Totally weak, just keep eating those lead paint chips. And then another one, you know, being sedentary would probably be weak in terms of its association to obesity based off a study like this. Finally, uh, seat belts only reduce the risk of mortality by 45%. So, you know, once you put it through the meat grinder of the algorithm and log the relative risk, uh, yeah, that's also weak. And final point on Dr. Drew Pinsky, you know, the narrative here is that, oh, because of all of these scientists selling out, they've told you that meat is bad, you know? But Dr. Drew on his show is sponsored Sponsored by Paleo Valley and their beef sticks. <laughs> And maybe scientists and doctors are easier to buy than a pack of Marlboros. No, his meat sales might be a little, say, motivating on the topic of meat and health, one might say. There is so much 
motivated reasoning and motivated interpretation of data. It's just ridiculous. And I will say this beef jerky he's selling is marketed as like super healthy and natural, but just as WebMD mentions, even what people call quote, high quality beef jerky is still processed meat. So while this video is about unprocessed red meat, he's directly promoting and selling processed red meat, which is as a category associated with even higher levels of diseases and higher levels of certainty. So now we have to distinguish that there is the interpretation of the study by Big Think and Jimmy Dore, and then there's also the actual studies, inaccuracies, and shortcomings as well. And not often do you see directly published responses, boom, right on a study, in this case, in the Nature Medicine article. Yes, they published a scathing response to this burden of proof study that was by Dr. Walter Willett of Harvard and four other of his Harvard colleagues, who, by the way, co-authored a study that was cited by the burden of proof people in their original study. So among other points, Walter and co say, quote, we believe that there are serious methods methodological issues with their meta-analyses. Quote, it is our view that burden of proof studies are misleading and the star rating system is too simplistic. And in terms of methodology, they say that these uncertainty intervals that they used were several times stricter than these classic confidence intervals, which then, as they use an example of the diabetes connection, which was a highly statistically significant association for 100 grams versus none, having a 24% increased risk. However, due to their methodology, their lower 95% boundary includes Included no association, which then affected the star rating. And we did get into some nerdy drama here with the burden of proof authors responding in a bit of a catty way that they recognize that they are looking for an explanation as to why the results of the burden of proof analysis do not agree with their previous beliefs. And the study itself was criticized in Scientific American with various experts like Marian Nestle, NYU nutrition professor, saying that in the past, cigarette companies used a doubt casting strategy and some research for the meat industry could use these low star ratings in a similar way. Or perhaps some meat loving political commentators on YouTube might use them in a similar way. I would also add that the rating system gives something that even has a high level of certainty, but a sort of lower power of effect compared to like a four times risk or 10 times with smoking still gives that a low star rating. But this is meant to be a rating system used by policymakers and consumers when if we actually look at how something like a 12% risk could could affect actual deaths. In terms of heart disease, our leading killer in the US, we could be talking about 100,000 deaths a year, which are not weak and are not a one-star association. And Frank Hu is also covered in Scientific American. He's one of Walter Willis' Harvard colleagues. And he mentions that a lot of this can have to do with what populations you're looking at. One example of this could be how studies from one country that has a lower range in meat consumption can be used to sort of wash out the results of a, another study with a high meat consumption. For example, if you have an Asian country where low meat consumption is none and high is equivalent to our type of flexitarian diet, so then the meat disease effect is likely going to be less noticeable and more easily washed out by other factors. Now, sort of like how if there was a country that was smoking either zero cigarettes or one cigarette a day versus another one that did either zero or one pack a day, obviously the results are gonna be much clearer in the pack a day one. However, then averaging those two countries together could muddy the relationship between lung cancer and smoking. Who says, quote, this doesn't mean that the heterogeneity or the difference in population is due to uncertainty of the findings. And I I would add that there are other population effects as well. For example, in a country like the US where eating maybe less red meat could just mean that you're eating more animal fat and animal protein from other sources like dairy and chicken, etc. So to this 2023 study, it's worth mentioning that higher plant protein meant 36% lower mortality, higher animal meant over 50% higher mortality. And from the study on 400,000 people, replacement of 3% of energy from animal protein with plant protein was inversely associated with overall mortality. We're talking 10%. And while we're placing red meat protein in particular with plants, we're talking about a 13% lower and 15% lower risk of mortality in men and women respectively. But Jimmy reads more of the criticisms of the study from the Big Think article. Each year, hundreds of frankly lazy studies are published that simply <laughs> attempt to find an observational link between some action, eating a food, for example, and a health outcome like death or disease. More, moreover, many are based on self-reported consumption. The simple fact is that people can't remember what they ate with any accuracy. Most are plagued by confounding variables 
confounding variables. For example, <laughs> perhaps meat eaters simply eat fewer vegetables or tend to smoke more or exercise less. I guess they're saying that these researchers are lazy for not adjusting for confounding factors and using questionnaires, which we'll get to in a second. But these studies did adjust for a lot of things. Just opening one up randomly, we can see that they adjusted for things like exercise, smoking, calories, alcohol, BMI, and a lot more. And ironically, from this study we just covered, more meat protein was associated with more exercise. So, mwah. And back to Marion Leslie on this topic, she says, it's like they quote, just discovered that it's difficult to do nutrition research. What do we know that we didn't know before? <laughs> Jimmy mentions that recall of food on food questionnaires can be inaccurate. So should we just throw away all of nutritional epidemiology? Well, no, from this meta-analysis on the accuracy of these questionnaires, quote, relatively high correlations for one year indicated that food frequency questionnaires can provide an accurate estimation of long-term dietary habits. So no, this huge trove of data showing the connection between unprocessed red meat and all these diseases is made of valid science yeah, maybe something is over or even under adjusted for, like they might be adjusting for something that red meat caused when they shouldn't. We're getting a picture that is consistent. More red meat, more disease and mortality. The strangest part of all of this logically is that there's this weird top down conspiracy angle of like, oh, scientists lied to you to make red meat look bad. And I guess the implication from one commenter here was that like Bill Gates wants you to eat plant meat alternative things, which sadly that was deleted and they didn't actually talk about that in the video. But I just thought that was so funny and I immediately commented under his video that this study they're using to support meat was actually funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which part of me likes to think is why they took the video down, but probably has nothing to do with it. And while it is true that Bill Gates has said in wealthy countries we should eat less meat, he is not a vegan, he's not a vegetarian, he eats meat and has even outright said it's not worth even advocating to get people to eat less meat because they don't listen. So that brings us to the question, are these meat alternative companies so powerful that they have just been manipulating the meat data all this time for that poor little meat industry that can't even defend themselves? Well, a quick look shows that the meat industry is a one and a half trillion dollar industry and the alternative meat industry is at best maybe 19 billion. So the meat industry is about 80 times larger than the meat alternative industry and therefore is gonna be that much more powerful in terms of its influence, how it spends money on research and you know pays people to write articles or it pays people like doctors to sell their beef sticks. And I didn't wanna to go too deeply into it before covering the study earlier, but back to the topic of cancer here. I did see that Drew has fought and overcome prostate cancer, you know, over a decade back. You know, we're not talking about what caused his cancer in general, but it makes sense that he's concerned about it. And I think he should be concerned that in certain cases, even red unprocessed meat is very associated with cancer. For advanced prostate cancer, increased risks were associated with higher grilled red meat and well done red meat of about 60 and 50% increased risk. And then I should add from the UK Biobank study that the vegetarian group, which was vegans and vegetarians combined, had a 31% lower risk of prostate cancer. But that would only imply a drop of like 100,000 cases of prostate cancer in the US if everybody stopped eating meat. So yeah. I'm just gonna say weak. I also think it's really weird that throughout this whole video, Jimmy didn't mention any of the environmental issues associated with red meat, in particular beef consumption. And then I realized that's because he's just so off the deep end in terms of anything that could be a conspiracy that he thinks that now that like billionaires are exaggerating climate change to control you, as this quote you can pause to read says. So yeah, to the Jimmy in the past that was concerned about climate change, as this study shows, there is just a massive stepwise increase in carbon footprint as you eat more animal products with vegans emitting the lowest by far. And then finally, we have the topic of ethics. And this one's really interesting here because I don't even need to say anything. He can speak for himself from a video seven years ago. Thanks to Barbara for sending me this video where he's responding to these cows being let out of the barn after a long winter. Here he is. <laughs> And watch how they do the thing that dogs do. They want to play, they put their head down, and they... So I don't think I can eat meat anymore. <laughs> they look like they're acting like dogs, in a sense. So it makes me have feelings for them. <laughs> it seems, it just seems mean to eat them. I think that speaks for itself. Anyway, in the end, there's a clear sort of pipeline 
of how this got so blown out of proportion. First of all, we have the original researchers who through flawed methodology really downplayed the risk and through just poor language usage and rating system made it seem like there was less risk than there actually was in terms of how many people actually die from eating red meat in terms of its risk. So then that study was amplified through one step in an editorialized Big Think article, which you know further downplayed the dangers of red meat. And then Jimmy Dore just took a megaphone to that and was like, there's all caps, no risk in terms of your health with red meat. However, as we can see, it's still heavily and strongly associated with a variety of diseases and increased mortality, like they're just wrong. In the end, I think Marion is right that doubt is the strategy and you know, sowing more doubt in the realm of meat is just gonna make people feel fine with eating as much as they want. And it's gonna help, you know, propel people into fringe diets like the carnivore diet, which is of course even worse in all these aspects. Anyway, you guys are getting the point. Definitely keep an eye out for my upcoming ebook, Level 5 Vegan. Hopefully I can finish it soon for you guys. I've had a lot of fun making it. And of course, feel free to let me know down below if there were any points that I missed. Just let me know your overall thoughts. This was an interesting one. And of course, feel free to like, subscribe and all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.